In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. <clears throat> it's a great day to be here in this place that we visit for a few days for myself and visit yourself. In a year ago, I was around here and glad to be here to share with you your cross. The Catholic faith was all over, and the cross that you have is the cross that we have in the place that the Blessed Lord has given to us. But as you know, my station is in New York, in the U.S., and we have lots of work there. But the sense of friction that are in there, there are sense of friction all over the world, because the Catholic Church is suffering. The situation of today's world is godless, and can be despondent. But today's gospel is giving us hope, and the Holy Catholic Church unites the epistle. So there's a epistle with today's gospel in how we can carry the cross even in adversities. And the Blessed Lord will provide us all the means that we need so that we will finally get the goal for what we will create we were created, that's mean the salvation of our soul in the eternal salvation in gladness with God. So in addition, this 14th Sunday after Pentecost, today, September 15, is the Feast of Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows, a great festivity of the second class in America, in here in London, especially you have uh, the Seraphites, a great congregation, and the most remembered uh, Seraphite the member of that congregation, Father Faber, in the last century. He great books. If you have that time today, just to keep an, keep an eye, but look, his book is the, At the Foot of the Cross of Father Faber. At the Foot of the Cross, he explained in seven different ways the seven sorrows of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And out of these seven sorrows, we can put one of them out to put together with today's, in today's sermon. As you know, the seven sorrows of the Our Lady, the beginning of them was when the Our Lady, having the baby Jesus, she went 40 days after the birthday and presented in the temple. And when the Blessed Mother, the Mother of God, the Mother of us, presented, the priest, the old priest, Simon, took it and offered to God and was supposed to be the gladness of the mother offering her son to God and in, in reward of coming back to her was the first sorrow, the sorrow that Our Lady received piercing her heart and how the, the Blessed Mother of God little by little will offer from the childhood of the Blessed Lord preparing the Blessed Lord as a victim for the great sacrifice of the cross. It's in that mystery, in the first sorrow of the Mother of God, that we can see all the works of the life. The widows, the young mothers, the babies, St. Joseph, especially the priesthood. The old priest who, in his old age, he was praying to God, asking the means in the time. Remember, the old man, Samuel, he was waiting for the Redeemer. And there were 4,000 years waiting for that Redeemer. And if from his childhood, the, this priest, he offered to God, he was a high priest. And how in the elder age of his life, he made a covenant with God. And this covenant was, let me not die until I will see with my own eyes the Savior. This is the prayer of Rachel Schoenfeld. This is the prayer of Rachel Schoenfeld. Let me not die until I will see how will be the seat of restoration of the Holy Catholic Church. And this is a sorrow of the mother of God. And this Simeon, Simeon was inflicted by providence, the sorrow of the mother of God. Because through her, Jesus Christ came into the world, and through her, there is no other way that we have to go back to heaven. 
So the deepest of the mysteries and the sorrows of the mother of God through the time growing the, the baby Jesus was suffering more and more until the last suffering of the mother of God. So that's why if you have time to go through this book of the sorrows, you will profit, especially in today's world, in today's situation of the church, and today's upside down world, to be at least stand and to have a good grip what the Blessed Lord wants us to suffer. So, one of the seven sorrows that is important to think about today, as I mentioned, and only is the exile to Egypt. Because you are exiled. All of us, we are in exilium. Tradition is not any longer in the church. It's, as you know, at that mystery, when the angel, St. Gabriel the King, asked St. Joseph to take the baby and the mother and bring it to Egypt. And what's the exile? This is one of the sorrows of the mother of God. And this is a situation of tradition and self even. We are not here in a, in, a, in a church. We're out of the building, but we have the faith. The mother of God had the baby Jesus. She went out of Holy Land and she went to Egypt where they worship the devil, the devil. And in order to prepare that venture, that sorrow, that mystery, Almighty God sends in Joseph. As Almighty God will see St. Joseph to help us to go through this crisis of the church. As St. Joseph can help you to get a church here in London. There is nothing impossible to God. But the Blessed Lord wants us to believe in the exilion, away from churches, away from everything, even away from priests. The Blessed Lord wants us to trust in Him as the mother of God trusts the Holy Providence. And it's St. Joseph who he was prompt to do the will of God. If you really want to have this great devotion to St. Joseph, you can see in the infancy, in the mysteries of the infancy of the Holy Family, how the Holy Providence was providing all the means to the man. The woman is different, but also had to provide for herself. And the Blessed Lord will provide more things to the woman than for me. That's why in your prayers, if you are a lady, ask whatsoever you want to God. But be happy for whatsoever He brings you back. For the man is different. For the man, he has to pro he's a provider. And one of the provisions of the, of the prayer of a man are priests. It's not for the mother. The mother is to offer victims and to prepare the victims. But the priests, they get vocations. And this is why in the Holy Providence, he had provided all the means to St. Joseph to go little by little and perform the will of God. And this, one of the strongest was to the, going to the exile to Egypt with no family, with no job, with, not, with fear. They had, to, they had to go away at night. So the pain, the suffering of St. Joseph is also real. And this is a mystery because in the exile that we have, we have to keep the spirit of family. And if you are with not that spirit of family, especially the spiritual family of the Holy Catholic Church, we will fail. And in this kind of stress is when today's gospel comes through it. Because when we are in exile, when adversity is against us, and there is no human speaking, no human mind can understand what is going on in our life, in the person, or in our family, that everything maybe is backwards, especially for a man who loses, loses his job. More and more men lose their job, and they are not providers. So, the, in this kind of adversities, is when faith has to be stronger, much, much stronger. And this is the faith that St. Joseph went to maintain with cheerfulness 
He was not just bad. He had the cheerfulness to go and practice in the providence and how he, in a foreign place, with the foreign language. They did not speak the, the language of the town. So everything but, but, but works for them. And they remain in the child keeping the faith. And this is the point of today's sermon, keeping the faith. By any kind of distress. But it is true, in order to keep the faith, the blessed Lord will exhaust all the means that, humanly speaking, we can provide. However, in today's gospel is given the attitude. And this is the core of the, to these few words in the sermon. The attitude that we receive the providence of God. And there are only two attitudes. One, what you do with God, everything in your life, what you do without Him. There's none of it. With Him or without Him. The modern world prefers without Him. And it is true. You will be faithful. Either way, you take one or you two take the other. Is There is faithfulness. So that's why in that saying, St. Augustine says there are two laws. One, to the love of oneself to reject God or the love of God to reject oneself. Two cities. Actually, it's the core of Charles Dickens' the novel about the two cities. But you love yourself to reject any help, or you love God to reject anything else for God. And that attitude, he, there is a danger, a danger that today we have to think about it, even if we are in exile. And that is lukewarmness. Lukewarmness is no good friend to be with. And the difficulty of lukewarmness is you never you know you are in but when you are far away from God. Lukewarmness, since it's a cure of ours, is like the, the worm. Walks very slow that you do not know he's walking or not walking. And lukewarmness attacks in ourselves little by little, little by little. And if today all tradition in the world is suffering, it's because we became lukewarmness. In a plain American way to say it, is the comfort zone. Comfort. St. Ignatius of Loyola, preaching in the spiritual retreat, he said that the devil has three weapons to attack those people, people who would like to be good. And the three weapons, and the only weapons, that he will use, the devil will use against anybody who wants to be good, is richness, material things, money, comfort, human respect, and pride. There are three weapons that the devil uses against us. The first one is effective. The second one is too effective. The third one is very effective. But all to us, we are caught by the three of them. So, in order to get us, how do we find out if he has gotten us? If he really got grip of us? But in purity, in thoughts, words, and actions. But never the devil will attack us in impurity first. The first one will be comfort moment. The second, human respect. And by human respect, we betray God, like Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate finally crucified God, Christ, because he had human respect. He heard from the people, the scribes and Pharisees, if you let him go, you are against Caesar. And anybody who is, makes himself a king is against Caesar. You will lose your power, human respect. And finally, Pontius Pilate crucified Christ. 
And the third one, very strong, is pride. However, the blessed Lord will allow sometimes all of us, all of us, to be in a hard time. Because if really we want to love God, if really we want to go to heaven, if we believe really what is the holy sacrifice of the mass, the blessed Lord will have some kind of purification, some kind of stress to provide like the fire proves the gold, like the fire proves the silver. So in the spiritual way, we will be what we call desolated. Desolated, it means anything you do works. You pray, you don't get it. You are single, you pray for a husband, you have nobody. You are married, you pray for your family, and they break you. You pray, we went to a priest, and the priest, they come, and they come. Doesn't work anything. We are desolated. So the same thing Ignatius said, when we are in desolation, there are three reasons why we are in desolation. The first one, lukewarmness, the penalty. That is the one that we have to be careful. So how do we find out that if we, oneself, our family, our church, or the whole church, even the, a country is in the lukewarmness? You have three signals, and you have this red flag, you, you have to be careful. And the, one, the, the important one is to justify our sins. All of us, we have a petty sin that we justify. Petty sin could be a curse, a second glance, a dream. To have a cell phone that your father does not know that you have it. You're a wife. To have an email account that nobody knows, but only one man that is not your husband. Petty, petty things. To justify oneself the wrong things that we do. Maybe there are no great at the beginning. There are no serious. But little by little, we will come from lukewarmness to a cold state of sinful life. Little by little. That's why we compromise. At the more the body work compromise. In every single level. For example, for a priest. When the priest does not believe any longer his celibacy, or the vows that he had with God, he will place his eyes in something that is forbidden to justify himself. And this is because there is an original sin. So we start to justify things that we shouldn't do. Well, if you, are, if you are married, they say, your husband doesn't come on time, he's all the time at work, family life is done, do you know I have a friend? I talk to my friend, and little by little, the wife does not believe any longer the fidelity of the matrimony. Little by little. And well, that is not coming, and the children, they are alone, especially boys, and they become wild. And after, they defeat dad and mom. Lukewarmness is dangerous because we compromise. So the problem, for example, in a different level, or the same direction, is that those bishops that are supposed to be traditional, speaking the traditional concepts, especially the, the bishops led by, left by Archbishop Feb, they learn to speak the language of the modernists. When the priests of the of traditional priests of the society, they start to accept the hermeneutic or continuity or continuity of the hermeneutic, they can spot the same language and little by little they will collapse because look words. Look words 
fogs our mind. Lukewarmness wakes our will. That's why. How do we find out if we have it? When we justify our petty sins. And this dangerous. Second red flag for lukewarmness is when we delay to do our duties. You have to wake up at a clock and you wake up five ten, six o'clock. You have to do a test and you fail. You have to do your work and you skew yourself. So when we start to delay our duties, to lead away the priesthood, for example, what's happening with Martin Luther? What was the first signal that he gave to everybody that they saw he's in that trouble? He did not bring any more his brethren. He said, it's better and it's stronger the word than the prayer. And he left it. He didn't pray anymore. And finally, he justified his life. And after he, he said, Saliba said, no anymore. And he got married with a sister, with a nun. What's happening with Henry VIII? He wanted to have a, a son. And how many times he married afterwards? Many times. What happened with the other ladies? What's happened afterwards? The lukewarmness got him in his mind and his will. He not only justified, but he didn't do his duties. And if we don't do our duties, sooner or later, we will relapse or we will fall. And this is the sad story of everybody. And the last signal, the last signal that we have to, to see if we have this, this kind of, 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 of flaw, this kind of he fog in our mind or in our will, is when we start to go off constantly, constantly of our track. So today, as conclusion, one example is given to the priest who do the, the, the bravery. Today is the Holy Catholic Church asked the priest to read the book of Tobias. And Tobias is a good example to how in, how in against in adversity or difficulties in exile, like St. Joseph, how Tobias, he decided to do, is the first chapter, if you have time to read Tobias today, the first chapter, only the first chapter, is the most important. He said, Tobias was close to Galilee, did you know the Holy Scripture? Godly was a place that were the high places, that were worshipped the idols. So, Tobias lived above in the time that St. Manasseh, another king, conquered him. But, say the Holy Scripture, Tobias decided to be keeping the faith. And he decided once every three years to go to the temple, in the state to go to the idols. First thing, second thing, thing, he got married with a lady who had his faith, and he decided to do one thing, to teach his son in the truth. Tobias, the last thing, to practice his faith, to practice. Religion is a practice of life. So Tobias, in all this adversity, he kept the faith when everybody gave up. That's our case. Everybody in the world doesn't believe that in the marriage is supposed to be fidelity. After the synod of the Amazon in Brazil, no many priests of the Catholic faith believe, will believe, that the celibacy is for the priesthood. You know that. The synod of the bishops in Brazil next month, they have three topics to talk. For that moment on, the Catholic priest could be married for them. Or the marriage priest could come back. Or the women could be a priestess. Three topics to talk in the synod. So, in the adversity, 
is when the faith is proved. So more and more, the example of Tobias will be great to think about. And because at the end of the book say, Saint Raphael the Archangel came to help Tobias. And Saint Raphael told Tobias, because your faith was acceptable to God, was necessary that temptation will prove your faith. And this is the exile of Saint Joseph. Because we know that the traditional mass is true. Is God who comes from heaven on the altar by the priesthood, as the Holy Catholic Church preaches, as Jesus Christ gave it to us, is necessary that every single priest who believes in the transubstantiation will be tempted. And the temptation is to don't believe any longer. And this is your temptation. And this is the exile that we go. What we should do, remain in the truth. Offer to God that no matter what, we will be straight in that path of salvation. What is the path of salvation? Jesus Christ is through God and through man. The only Savior of the world who came into the world through our lady to be a victim and already prepared him to be a victim in the Calvary and leave the priesthood for the second coming of Christ to believe in the last minute that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Let's have encouragement because without it, the devil will give us harder and harder time. So, two things, conclusions, for encourage us to give encouragement to us to keep going. And first is have hope. Even though the world is upside down, God is the master. And he will give us all the things. That's why in today's gospel say, look first for the kingdom of God and his justice and everything else will give you in a dish. We cannot serve the masters. What do you want or how do you want to handle it in your life? With God or without Him? If you decide to do with God, you will be blessed. But you will suffer. But you are not alone. The whole family will be with you. If you are a man, represent yourself. He will help you to provide what you need to keep going on your faith. In particular, a priest who will understand your distresses and will send you the means, sacraments, to get in heaven. If you are a woman, you are a woman, the blessed Lord through our lady will give you the grace to believe in problems and to do not complain against the things of God. Because finally, God will give you what is needed for the salvation of your soul. And let us pray in this little chapel that the blessed Lord will send you always a priest to give you the encouragement to give you the faith that you have received. That faith that our church of the faith believe like the Simon, the old priest who offered the victim. He offered his sacrifices so that he will believe that the child Jesus is the Messiah. He offered the sacrifices to endure for us the same sort of pain in desolation that of the mother of God received at that moment. Therefore, my dear brethren, take courage. We are not alone, we are in exile, we will come back. We will have again the temples because we have the faith that built those temples. We are not lost. If God is with us, nobody against us. But we have must believe and we have to believe that the grace of God works before, work before, works today and will work for the children of tomorrow. 
These children need, need, need the hope, and there is, there is the hope to, to keep going. And therefore, let's give the attitude that is first is God. Who can give us this encouragement? Nobody else but children. And this is the last example. In the time of the Christians, in 1926, many priests they were dead. And a young little boy, or the boy, he was 11 years old. His name is Little Joseph. When he served a Sunday Mass, there were not many people at church, but when Mass was over, at the door there were soldiers waiting for the priest. And when the priest was going away from the altar, when he buried them, Jasper, Charles, another boy, the soldiers, they were leading him to outside. Outside of the church, the priest is standing, looking eye to eye to those soldiers. He was shot to death. The little boy ran to the top, the top to see with his own eyes the death of the priest. And when he heard the shots and the priest collapsed, the little boy looked at heaven and he said, I want to be a priest. The desire to do the things with God, for God, in God, I want to be a priest. He was 11 years old. But I am to leave it. What I have to do today is to say priest. And he went to the priestess, walking. And when he walked in the camp of the priestess, the general said, what you are doing here? I want to save the priest. I saw how they killed mine. I have to help the others who are alive. But you are too little. Go back home. And when you will be older, you will come. No, 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 no. I know how to cook. I know how to clean weapons. I know how to, to take care for horses. And after several weeks, the general said, if you want to stay here, your job will be one thing. You carry up the banner of our lady of Guadalupe. He was an expertise. This body was an expertise horse rider, horseback rider. And his job was to carry that standard. Bang of a lady. Once they were in an ambush. And when they were in an ambush, the shots were directly to the general. And the horse of that general was dead. The general fell down. And the little boy ran after him. And he said, General, my general, come over. Come over. And he helped the general to jump on the horse. But because there were two and the shots there were many, the little boy jumped out, hit the horse, and the horse just ran. The general was wounded, and the general thought that the little boy was behind him, and they ran out. Horse and general, but the boy was left behind. He took the weapon, he tried to save himself, he had no more bullet, and he had to surround. He surrounded to the army. And when he surrounded, he was caught as a prisoner. And when he was in the prison, he said, you have to tell us where are the priests. And the little boy said, no way. If you don't tell us, you will die. Okay. He was 11. Okay. And he was a prisoner in the sacristy. And because he was very strong in his will, was captured soon after a friend of him, another boy, 11 years old, prisoners. So they after they say, if you don't tell me, Joseph, where the priests are, your friend will die. And Joseph told the friend, be ready. Be ready, because I am not telling them where are the priests. So the general of the bad guys came, put a rock in the neck. This is the last chance to save your friend. Where are the priests? 
Are you ready? I am not telling them. Rex, he was kind of holding in the tree. And little Joseph told, saw him, pray for him. I am not telling you where the priest. Tomorrow is eternal. If you don't tell us where are the priests, it's your turn. And every time Joseph used to say, Viva Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. He was put on the table before his martyr. And with a knife, he was cut in the sole of his feet, the two of them, 11 years old, to walk barefoot, bleeding to the place that he will be executed. Do you want to tell us what are the priests? No, no, no. Long live Christ the King. So he was punished. He was attached with the hand in a rope, butch, and every time he make an step going to the cemetery with a machete, his toes they were cut. Pack, pack, every step. He was bleeding, and every time suffering and falling. He was walking from the church to the cemetery. 11 o'clock at night, they called the mother and the father. And the mother and the father had to be hidden. People were around, even the godfather. He's godfather. You want to tell us where the priest? No, no, no. They went all the way to the graveyard where already was a hole six feet down. Look at everybody. See the last chance. Do you want to tell us where are the priests? Remember, for little Joseph, the priest was another Christ. He said, No. The Godfather, his Godfather, said, Stop, no, that's nonsense. Let them know where are the priests, and you will save your life. And you will not give grief to your mother nor your father. And the little lost Joseph looked his godfather and said, Godfather, Godfather, you gave me the faith that I am believing who is the priest. And you tell me to give up? No. I am dying for you because you give me that faith that today I am dying for it. And that moment he received, I stuck in the back and he vomited blood himself and he cut the blood kneeling down and almost lifeless he made with his hand his finger a cross on the dirt and with his blood he folded look his mother and say mom I love you I see you will see you in heaven Viva Cristo Rey and he died 1929 not many years ago the encouragement of the children when they believe in heaven. This is our inheritance, heaven. Look for everything on earth which brings you into heaven and you will have encouragement. And this little Jesus has played many, many families in Mexico with the Christians because his faith was the holy providence that St. Joseph provided for him to get in heaven. Not only for him, but his mother and father. Not only mother and father, but the godfather. Not everybody, but the, those children that after his example, they say, I want to be a priest. Look for the kingdom of God first, and everything else will come to be. This is the lesson of today. This is the lesson with St. Joseph. This is the lesson with the Mother of God. This is the lesson in the exile that tradition leaves today. <coughs> God is with us, don't worry. He will care for us. Let's keep the faith in a wonderful place that you have here in London, where once was God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.